the ocean, a seemingly endless expanse of water stretching to the horizon that has since time immemorial captured the fascination of those drawn by its siren call. Its possibility, potential in the future. Its undulating waves support coastal civilizations. Its sea acts as lifeblood for maritime commerce. Its temperate climate nourishes the body while salted breezes feed the soul. Landed empires covet coastal bastions to tentatively hold on to a fragment of the waters, and explorers venture out to realms uncharted, seeking rich glory beyond the horizon. But beneath the surface, a second life lies submerged. A hidden world unto itself opens up under the rolling surf, filled with wonder and tantalizing possibility. Luminescent reefs support lively ecosystems of variegated species ranging from fish to giant octopus to slumbering leviathans and benthic dwellers. Life beneath the ocean waves is beautiful but no less dangerous than the surface. It's unpredictable, a realm as chaotic and fickle as seaborne tempests and biting gales. One race has come to dominate the waters through understanding of the ebbing tides, a species that embodies the stunning beauty, the cold malice, the deep wisdom of the abyssal realm they inhabit. Constructing elaborate sunken cities, establishing empires of conquest and commerce, they are nonetheless inscrutable to surface dwellers, wrapped in opaque mysticism. Cunning warriors and fiercely loyal, they defend their waters with martial skill worthy of remembrance in the tomes of history. They are the Murpho. Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebarians YouTube channel, and welcome to our study in tides as we explore the history and characteristics of merfolk across Magic the Gathering's vast multiverse. Merfolk are a marquee creature type for blue mana, and are, as a result, deeply entrenched in the philosophies and characteristics hallmark of this color. They inhabit the waterways, oceans, islands, and rivers suffused with blue mana. These environs instill in merfolk a sense of wonder, of mysticism, of opportunity. Many races of merfolk value knowledge above all else and pursue it for its own sake. They plumb depths and scour ruins hidden beneath the waves to uncover arcane truths about their worlds. Hard-won discoveries are secretly guarded. As the color of illusion and misdirection, merfolk excel in the ways of subterfuge and espionage. Employed as spies, couriers, brigands, freebooters, and thieves, merfolk are adept in the acquisition of all things. Their thirst for knowledge breeds large contingents of wizards, and many merfolk pursue the practices of magecraft. This allows them to flex mental ingenuity and put information into action. But blue mana also tends towards aloof coolness found in fact. Several merfolk races are considered unfeeling and cold-blooded. They seldom interact cordially with surface beings and staunchly defend waterways from outsiders, safeguarding the flow of tides. Some races, which we'll expand upon later, have taken on the unity and structure offered by white mana, the reverence and connection to nature found in green, or the sinister obscurity of black. Physically, merfolk are as variable in appearance as the plains in which they dwell. Some have powerful muscled tails with fins that propel them like razors through undercurrents. Others stand on two legs and frequent the shoreline to raid, patrol, or explore. Some slink amongst the depths, never to breach the surf, while others often emerge from their underwater realms. A few key features, however, unify most races of merfolk across the multiverse. Their bodies are slender in shades of blue to blue-green, offering slight camouflaging protection in their environments. Merfolk sport gills or manes of fins around their faces and often possess webbed hands to surge through waterways. Most all merfolk, despite varying durations spent on soil, are amphibious, capable of transitioning between firm earth and fluid waters. It's clear which realm they prefer, sleek, mesmerizing, and efficient swimmers. There are many unique differences between merfolk, physicality, culture, and beliefs across the blind eternities. We'll begin our study in tides where most things do, on the large story plane of Dominaria. But before we begin, I want to give a comment courtesy shout out to another one of our amazing community members, highlighting the wonderful support for the channel. This comment comes from Fleet Ingtime in regard to the Plane of Kaldheim Explained video and reads, Okay, so far this is my favorite attempt at MTG storytelling on YouTube thus far, and I'm all over this stuff right now. Your voice is nice, stable, and level. I like how you keep the card display simple, transitions, etc. Thank you for doing this. Well, thanks so much for the kind words and appreciation. 
So glad you enjoy the content. I put a great deal of passion into it to help connect the audience to their favorite games. I'm glad it turns out. All right, let's dive in. The most prominent of Dominarian merfolk rose with the underwater empire of Vodalia within the Voda Sea that surrounded the island continent of Sarpedia in the ancient past. The Vodalians were just one of five great nations on the continent, whose glorious rise and precipitous fall is catalogued in the Fallen Empire set. The origin myth of Vodalia holds that the merfolk were created from silts and seawater by the goddess of the Pearl Moon, Svelun, who shaped them in her image. From their loyal devotion, Svelun bestowed upon the merfolk a safe haven in the Voda Sea from which they would build a lasting empire. The flavor text of Svelunite Priest highlights Vodalian theology and reads, Early Vidalians worshipped Svelun, goddess of the Pearl Moon. Later, she became a more abstract figure. Far more than pacifist priests, the Vidalians vaulted to greatness through conquest. They subjugated their realm by the sword and protected domains with martial skill, seen in cards like Vidalian Knight and Vidalian Soldiers, whose flavor text reads, Vidalian rank is displayed by the colors and patterns of their skin. Beware the color red, that is the badge of the Empress's favor. But this great empire was doomed to crumble when the Silex blast brought forth climatic upheaval and Ice Age encroached. Plummeting water temperatures allowed the invasive race of Homerids to proliferate and expand south. This crustacean and aggressive species raided Vidalia, and the speed at which they reproduced was no match for the merfolk soldiers. The empire was brought to its knees as it buckled under constant pressure. With several battles lost, Empress Galena abandoned the once great empire to its fate and along with several thousand refugees fled to safer waters around the domains and continent of Arona. Here, a new Vodalia rose from the ashes of old. Merfolk in this new realm are cold, cunning, and lethal, organized into a martial empire with strict hierarchy. Their power extends beyond the surf as merchant settlements and ports are extorted to pay tribute for Vodalia's protection. We hear of their proud martial stance in the flavor text of Coral Colony. The seafloor is strewn with the wreckage of Vodalia's would-be conquerors. And the knightly order of the Pearl Trident showcases their acumen. Vodalian also employed deep-sea predators in their defense, as seen in the Leviathan Slin Voda, Rising Deep, and used magic to bolster troops. Next are the merfolk and citizens of the Burbis Empire in the watery depths surrounding the continent of Otaria. These merfolk are unique in the ability to transform and morph their lower bodies at will between a powerful tail and two legs. They ruled an empire esteemed for its culture and intellectual advancement, but Burbis and its merfolk were crippled from within by the betrayal of a schemer known as Ambassador Laquatus. He pulled puppet strings and used deception to bring low the Burbis Empire in exchange for power and position within the court of the Mer Empire, ruled by Cephalids. In a stroke, the merfolk were decimated, their empire reduced to ruins and absorbed into the Mare Empire. Surviving Otarian merfolk are prisoners, slaves, underlings, and laborers to the ruling Cephalid elite. Not much else is known, but by examining Laquatus' own skill, one might infer that they were gifted mages, especially in illusion and mental magic. They're technically native to the artificial plane of wrath, the Rootwater Merfolk and their home of Sky Shroud were transplanted onto Keld's frozen tundra during the events of Phyrexian invasion. They would have succumbed to an icy death were it not for the intervention of Planeswalker Freilies, who protected Sky Shroud and Rootwater with her magic. The Rootwater are a feral and hideous race of merfolk. Their figures evolved after years of living in the dim light and choking root system of Sky Shroud above to resemble eels and as the flavor text of Air Bladder states, Random mutations among Rootwater merfolk were common, and disturbing. Rootwater are aggressive and savage. They attack without warning, kill without pause, and loot without sympathy. We see their malice in cards like Rootwater Thief and Matriarch. These merfolk prey on the elves and other inhabitants of Sky Shroud Forest above, lashing out at anything that wanders within reach of their swampy lair. The chilling lethality of these merfolk can be heard in the flavor text of Rootwater Commando. Rootwater merfolk are seldom seen these days, but elf corpses are as numerous as ever. Dominaria is a massive plain with deep oceans replete with life, its uncharted abyss home to many smaller merfolk tribes than those discussed, both known and unknown.
The idyllic and vibrant plain of Lorwyn is host to an extensive network of ponds and lakes interconnected by meandering rivers that lazily cut through rolling countryside. The rivers are a symbol of commerce and transportation, navigated by many cultures to trade, travel, or explore. Lorwyn's waterways are populated by the plains merfolk, which are locally called marrows. Marrows are masters of coin. They administer the trade that transpires along the rivers, arbitrate disputes, collect taxes, and ensure safe but lucrative conduct. We see this on display in cards like Marrow Commerce and Wanderwine Hub. Lorwyn's merfolk are ponderous and communal by nature. They study arcane knowledge held within the waters and charter communities in solidarity, giving them a strong foundation in the colors of blue and white mana. Marrow society is divided into schools of like-minded merfolk that share similar thoughts, ideals, and passions. Elder and sage marrows profess their teachings to gathered pupils eager to learn, which we can see in the illustration of some in the school, while the flavor text of Stony Brook Schoolmaster grants insight into the formation of schools. Marrow schools rarely form by design. They come together naturally as eager learners surround the wisest teachers. There are five marrow schools of significance. Each is guided by a strong leader called the Regiri. The Ink Fathom pride themselves in their knowledge of the depths, their cunning navigation and skills in surveillance of land dwellers. Silvergale School monitors the Marrow Lanes, ensuring peaceful commerce goes undisrupted through river systems. They use skillful magic to mitigate threats. Stony Brook Marrows are interested in preservation of knowledge, of plumbing hidden depths to uncover lost truths, but they are by no means pacifists. Armed with magical spears and gleaming bannerets, their soldiers neutralize enemies on shore or beneath the waves. The remaining schools, Paperfin and Weirwinder, are mysterious, likely owing to few followers and penchant for maintaining distance from landwalkers. Some marrow are adept wizards and use their magic to bend tides, shape rivers, alter currents, irrigate fields, and inundate floodplains. They are known as Aquatex. Their abilities on display in Aquatex Will and Surge Spanner. Like an architect drafting blueprints to visualize grand designs, so too do these marrows constantly shape the marrow lane's structure. As the Great Aurora surges across the plain, its transformative magic alters vibrant Lorwyn into grim, dark realm of Shadowmoor, its denizens changed into paranoid, depraved versions of their former selves. The marrows of Lorwyn undergo physical changes as they become more eel or piranha-like. Enlarged teeth sharpen and gills take on sinister visage. Their scales grow rough, capable of cutting flesh, and they assume harsh auras reflective of Shadowmoor's gloom, which we see in cards like Inkfathom Infiltrator and Drowner Initiate. So too does the marrow's disposition change. Shadowmoor merfolk are covetous opportunists. They steal, trick, murder, and raid the murky wanderbrine waters with impunity. They are terrors of the lanes, encapsulated in the flavor text of aphotic wisps. Marrows skulk the silty bogs around the wanderbrine, their very thoughts stained with evil. And the fallen state of disrepair of once lustrous wanderwine is given to us in Deep Channel Mentor's flavor text. The rivers can no longer provide safe passage for travelers and commerce. They serve only as highways for raiders and channels for blood and woe. The cutthroat marrows of Shadowmoor are self-serving, stained by evil reflected in their shift from white to black mana. No longer taken by the community of Lorwyn, the schools have fallen into disuse as each treacherous marrow looks after themselves. There is another race of merfolk that inhabit Shadowmoor, the Selkies. Selkies differ from marrow in physical features. They have smooth, human-like faces with haunting pearl eyes and long hair. Their lower bodies are reminiscent of seals or larger maritime animals than fish. Selkies are in tune with the natural world, which gives them a strong connection to green mana. They seek out the small treasures of hope and light, so rare on a plane of shadow. Selkies are filled with erstwhile longing, with a wanderlust for vast open seas. Confined to the Marrow Lanes river system, Selkies craft striking laments and dirges that highlight desires to return to a home they've never known. The shrill chorus rises above the reeds and we hear in the flavor text of Wistful Selkie. Selkies call to a sea they never swam, in a tongue they never spoke, with a song they never learned. Leaving behind the duality of Lorwyn, and we come to the dangerous plane of adventure, Zendikar. Impermanence and lethal transformation are hallmarks of a plane plagued by unique storms, 
quakes and upheavals, colloquially known as the Royal. The Royal shreds through Zendikar, rending the landscape in a devastating dance of creation through destruction. It's a harsh reality for Zendikar's denizens who must remain flexible and endure ever-shifting environments. The merfolk are no different. Like on most planes, Zendikar's merfolk are curious by nature. They seek knowledge and arcane wisdom beneath the surf, among benthic ruins and dark depths. But in a world of action, they're most interested in the application of such wisdom. Many are employed as scouts or guides who offer service to intrepid bands of explorers. Unlike those found on other planes, Zendikar and Merfolk have two fully formed legs and they spend as much if not more time outside the plane's sheltering waters. Their skin and facial features are also more reflective of their land-dwelling counterparts, retaining only residual fins and webbings that nonetheless increase swimming agility. Though Merfolk are spread across all of Zendikar's vast continents, they're most densely gathered around their enclave island within Halimar Bay on Tazim, where the Umara River meets the ocean. Scrolls and ancient tomes adorn enormous libraries from which archaeologists and arcanists divine precious information on the plane's dubious past. Though the enclave is their center, many merfolk consolidate in the waters beneath Sejiri's frozen tundra. From its chill depths, they seek a lost culture of ice merfolk within the underwater ruins of Benthedrix. We see them illustrated in the card Sejiri merfolk. Zendikari merfolk put their magical prowess to use against the plane's natural disasters that stem from the royal. Lull mages are adept in counter magic, which they use to quell the royal's violent outbursts and calm the shuddering landscape, which we see in Lull Mage Venter. While the flavor text of Molten Ravager states, Only the foolhardy would venture into the Akum Mountains without a Lull Mage to tame the raging rocks and living fires. Skills that are paramount for survival of a wilderness expedition. Merfolk can also be seen coursing across the plane's open skies as they ride domesticated birds or flying manta rays to survey the land. As with all on Zendikar, the merfolk suffered greatly with the emergence of the Eldrazi. Their homes were devastated and the population remains in a slow, steady decline. Zendikar's merfolk are fast becoming an endangered race. The exotic, alluring plane of Ixalan beckons explorers and conquerors alike to seek immortal glory on a largely unexplored continent that shares its name. Two races inhabit the continent. The Sun Empire of dinosaur-mounted humans patrol the eastern shore in rolling floodplains. The dangerous wild interior, however, is the merfolk's domain, and they guard it vigilantly. Ixalan's merfolk are vibrant in appearance. Bright blues and flares of green grant iridescent fin and scale. Jade, topaz, and other jeweled ornamentation adorn headdresses, armor, and weapons. Altogether, this bestows awesome majesty on the race. Merfolk are grossly divided into two subraces based on the color of mana in which they are most deeply entrenched. Green aligned merfolk prefer the dense jungles and firm soil of land rather than the interior's great river system. They are shaped by the green mana that suffuses this domain and wield it to devastating effect to strengthen themselves as seen in River Herald's boon whose flavor text reads, We are kin to the trees, and their strength is our own. Many guardians of the enormous ancient deep root tree have attuned to the forest's needs. Bulaline merfolk patrol navigable estuaries and branches of the great river. They busy themselves with waterway defenses as seen in river sneak and spell pierce. Seafloor oracle and riverwise auger show that blue merfolk aren't interested simply in Ixalan's defense but also in uncovering ancient secrets. But the land can't be segregated from the water. The river nourishes the jungle roots, which in turn grow boughs to safeguard the river. So too do merfolk embrace both aspects of nature, and many share green and blue mana costs. By necessity, merfolk society is a warrior society, but several strong wizards known as shapers augment defenses and direct nature's forces to foster growth. Their power to bend elements is on display in cards like Run Aground and Slice in Twain, whose text reads, The magic of the River Heralds is so great that even a single shaman can fend off a pirate landing party. While the text of Shapers of Nature highlights the merfolk's meticulous reverence towards the primal forces of the forest that surrounds them, shapers adapt nature to fit their needs and then return it to the way it was, leaving no trace of their passing. The Merfolk Nation on Ixalan are named the River Heralds due to their deep connection to the Great River and its rushing branches. 
In fact, their culture is divided into tribal bands based on the branch they defend, and their leader, so in tune with the vital life source, discards their own name for that of the tributary under their guidance. The nine tributaries are as follows. Tishana, Kumena, Pashona, Tuvasa, Kopala, Vuhana, Matika, Falani, and Notana. The river heralds were long ago tasked with defense of the lost city of Araska, a mysterious metropolis filled with forbidden greatness, and the powerful immortal sun artifact housed within, to ensure no tyrant or petty ruler would abuse its awesome strength for devious ends. The merfolk take their charge seriously and patrol Ixalan's jungle interior with aggressive industry. We see this in cards like Headwater Sentries and Sworn Guardian, whose flavor text reads, For the River Heralds, the immortal sun is an object of terror and devastation. The idea that anyone would retrieve it for their own use is utterly abhorrent. And again, their purpose is passed down in the flavor text of Gilded Sentinel. The River Heralds fight to keep all others from reaching the Golden City. The city has its own defenses. Besides Araska, the River Heralds bestow significance to the Deep Root Tree, an ancient remnant of a lost merfolk city. Its surrounding waters nourish both mind and body. The primal wellspring, source of the Great River, is also worshipped as holy ground and offers powerful mystical boons. With the discovery of Araska and the Immortal Sun, the River Herald's purpose is no more, and they face grave existential questions as they're led into an uncertain future. With the grandest merfolk empires and civilizations explored, it's time to turn our attention toward planes in which this race is present but doesn't command a significant role in the history or culture, beginning with the plain-wide city of Ravnica. The merfolk of Ravnica are an ancient race, long forgotten and only recently made their presence known when large sinkholes revealed a network of subterranean oceans. This tale is given to us in the flavor text of Merfolk of the Depths, which reads, when giant sinkholes opened across Ravnica, they revealed buried oceans in the merfolk, once thought to be extinct. And Coral Commando. Few Ravnicans are aware of the vast reefs in their world's hidden ocean. Far beneath the great sinkholes, where the light is blue and dim, merfolk tend the coral labyrinths that feed the benthic ecosystem. Ravnican merfolk are almost exclusively members of the Simic Combine, with mastery over blue and green mana to experiment on nature evolution, and genetic crossbreeding. Their most famous member is Zagana, once prime speaker and leader of the entire Combine. The bipedal merfolk of Arcavios spend a great deal of time on land, attending classes in renowned Strixhaven University. They have striking cranial fins, which they wear in elaborate hairstyles. Though centered in blue mana, merfolk are drawn to both the green mana of nature offered by Mathematical Quandric School and the fiery passions of red mana on display in the performances of Prismari College. In either case, merfolk are adept magic users and shape spells to their whims. The merfolk empire beneath the waves of the Capcho Sea on the plain of Chandelar is shrouded in mystery. In its golden age, the merfolk numbered countless but have since been hunted to near extinction as the flavor text of Maritime Guard reads. Chandelari merfolk are bipedal with elaborate framing fins. This race scorns outsiders and interacts little with others. Talrand, the leader of Capcho's remaining merfolk, has unquenchable ambition and turned his eyes towards the sky after securing rule of the sea. His magical salvos and ability to summon drakes allowed Talrand to slay the dragon Kalintri and claim dominion of the skies. On the fairy tale plain of Eldraine, merfolk are called Undines. Physically, they have long red hair and facial features similar to humans with muscled, scaled legs and tail fins. Undines are native to the murky waters of Lochmere and patrol the brackish weeds in search of treasures or lost travelers. Duplicitous and deadly, Eldraine's merfolk often lure naive souls with riddles and secrets, then mercilessly drown them which we see in illustrations of Drown in the Loch and Merfolk Secret Keeper, whose flavor text reads, Merfolk curiosity usually has dire consequences, but rarely for the merfolk. Undines pursue knowledge to the point of obsession, their every thought and action at the whim of their own overwhelming curiosity. The merfolk inhabitants of Theros are called Tritons, aptly so as many of their warriors wield trident spears as seen in Kior's follower and Triton cavalry. 
Although they spend much time in their underwater cities beneath foaming surf, tritons are bipedal and often raid human settlements along the Therosian temperate coastline as seen in the Triton Shore Stalker and Shore Thief. Tritons are devoted to Thassa, god of the sea, ancient knowledge and ponderous divination. They seek glory for their god through protection of the waterways and by plumbing the sea's depths for arcane wisdom. As seen in Master of Waves and Wave Crasher Triton, the Blue Line Merfolk have master wizards adept at shaping tide and surf. Merfolk, a race as mystifying as the crashing waves and dark abyss they inhabit. Found in myriad shapes and sizes, they are nonetheless united across the multiverse by a shared thirst for knowledge, an arcane mastery over magic, and a deep reverence towards and protection of the waters they call home. Perfect representatives of blue mana, they are a force unto their own, as relentless and inexorable as the ebbing of the tides. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this study in tides as we've explored the similarities and differences between merfolk races across the blind eternities. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on merfolk. Which plane holds your favorite, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of Lauren's storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast, or the blog where content is uploaded frequently. A huge shout out to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Your patronage means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. If you're interested in becoming a Lord Luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, check out patreon.com slash the Lordbarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.